elegant, gorgeous, opulent. This kimono is made from a fabric woven in Kyoto called Nishijin Ori. From the robes worn by courtiers in ancient Japan to the costumes of the age-old No Theatre, Japan has developed a textile tradition of remarkable refinement. Vibrant, multicolored motifs or understated check patterns. Nishijinori textiles come in many different colors and styles. Through the centuries, the Nishijinori weavers of Kyoto have overcome numerous challenges, sustained by their skill and perseverance. The beauty of these textiles has been praised around the world and draws the interest of many tourists visiting Kyoto. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at the allure and history of these sumptuous textiles, Nishijinori. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today we'll be looking at one of the most distinctive and gorgeous types of textiles produced in Japan, Nishijinori. Ori means weaving, and Nishijin refers to a neighborhood in the northwestern part of Kyoto, where I'm standing now. The streets are lined with old buildings, from which, if you listen closely, you can hear the click-clack of the looms working. The Nishijin district ranks alongside Lyon in France and Milan in Italy as one of the world's leading centers of luxurious textiles. And to the people in Japan, obi and kimono made from Nishijin Ori really are the epitome of luxury. Nishijin Ori was originally a generic name given to all textiles made in this small neighborhood. Today there are about 40,000 people involved in the Nishijin Ori textile industry. There are two basic methods for producing the designs used on Japanese kimono. One is to dye the textile itself, either by painting freehand or using a stencil. Yuzen is a well-known example of this technique. The other method is to dye the thread used to weave the textile. In this case, the yarn is dyed ahead of time and then threads of different colors are woven together to form the pattern. And this is the technique that's used in Nishijinori. The Nishijinori textiles of Kyoto are distinguished by their vibrant colors and the great variety of their designs. These fabrics are also used to make bags, neckties and other accessories. There is an old saying in Japan that Kyoto people are so fond of luxurious kimono that they'll bankrupt themselves on clothes. And nothing represents luxury in Kyoto more than Nishijin Ori kimono. These textiles are also an essential element in Japan's traditional performing arts. Since ancient times they have been used for no theatre costumes. The Gion Festival is the highlight of summer in Kyoto. Many of the tapestries decorating the floats are made of Nishijin Ori fabrics. Many different techniques are used for weaving Nishijin Ori textiles, resulting in a wide range of styles. Twelve different weaving techniques have been officially designated as traditional crafts. This fabric was woven in the Karaori style. Karaori means Chinese weaving, and the technique originated in China. But in Kyoto it was further refined and came to be used frequently in no costumes. It is woven so that thick, colored threads decorate the surface, producing an embroidered effect. The stately feel of these raised patterns is the hallmark of Karaori textiles. This is a pattern damask called Donsu. The way the warp and weft threads are interwoven produces beguiling motifs in the fabric. Some Donsu textiles even incorporate threads of gold and silver for use in luxurious kimono. From around the 17th century, these textiles began to be used more widely for women's clothing. To produce the Omeshi Ori style, the threads are twisted before they are woven. 
which produces a pattern of indentations on the surface of the fabric, creating an effect that is refined and elegant. To produce Nishijinori textiles requires more than 20 separate processes. First, sketches are made for the outline of the fabric. Marrying traditional motifs with a modern sensibility produces endless design possibilities. The threads are dyed by a process called itozome. Dyeing the threads before they are woven is one of the fundamental features of Nishijinori. As many as 20,000 different hues are produced. This vast palette of colors gives rise to fabrics with designs of marvelous intricacy. Once the sketch is completed, the dyed threads are woven to produce the fabric. Weaving requires both warp and weft threads. The warp threads are stretched out lengthways in front of the weaver. Then the weft threads are woven between them to create the pattern. This is known as tsuzure ori, or tapestry weaving. The coloured weft threads are inserted so that they wrap the plain white threads of the warp. During the weaving process, the reverse side of the fabric is uppermost, so the weaver has to use a mirror to inspect the progress of the piece as it is woven. Look closely at the weaver's fingertips, and you see that the nails are filed into serrations like the teeth of a saw. These serrated nails are used to tamp down the coloured weft threads into the pattern. To weave a single bolt of kimono fabric takes a tremendous amount of time. Sometimes it progresses at a rate of just one centimetre per day. So much depends on the use of colours and the amount of force applied during the weaving. The weaver's craftsmanship imbues each piece with its own distinctive character. This is a bolt of brocade kimono fabric. Threads of numerous different hues have been woven precisely to create each petal on the design. The fine gradations have the subtlety of a painting. A weaver can express his or her thoughts and feelings through the fabric. Because there's no limit to the number of colours that can be used, the weaver can create virtually any design imaginable. In Nishijinori, the passion of the Kyoto weavers for beautiful kimono is woven into each bolt of fabric. This workshop specializes in the first of about 20 processes that go into the making of Nishijinori, the initial design. Now before these craftsmen can start their work, what has to happen first is that this painting is generated. This is the original painting from which the design is made. This is the final product. It's an obi, a sash for a kimono. And as you can see, it's the same design. But for this obi to be woven, the next process from here that has to happen is this. This is a large piece of a kind of graph paper on which a representation of this original painting is made. Each of these squares in the graph paper in this case represents six threads. From design to design the number of threads on one square can change. This looks like it's just painted straight onto a piece of paper but if you look at it closely each one of these little squares has been filled in separately and there's a reason for that which I'll go into in a moment. On the right hand side here we have all these bars of different colors. These represent the different colored threads that are going to be used in the weaving and if you look across the painting at each place uh, this will tell you which colors are going to be needed um, for that one line across the weaving. Now when this whole thing is finished, and it takes about a month to, to complete this, 
it's then going to get scanned into a digital scanner and that digital information will be loaded into the loom and that will tell the loom how to weave the obby. After that there are still a number of processes to go through and each one of those processes has equally skilled and experienced craftsmen. All right, on our next video, we'll now look at how Nishijinori came to be made in Kyoto in the first place. The history of textiles in Kyoto dates all the way back to the 5th or 6th century. The powerful Hata clan from continental Asia settled in what is now the Uzumasa district of Kyoto, bringing with them the know-how for raising silkworms and weaving silk. After the capital moved to Kyoto in the 8th century, a refined culture developed around the court. The nobility demanded gorgeous garments, and the ladies began wearing sumptuous outfits with numerous layers of kimono. The weavers of Kyoto developed fabrics to meet this demand. The No Theatre, which appeared in the 14th century, was also integral to the development of textiles. Fabrics in the Karaori style, based on Chinese models, were widely used for no costumes. The name Nishijinori itself originates from the time of the Onin War in the 15th century. For ten years, warring factions of samurai split the capital into rival eastern and western sections. Nishijin was the main headquarters of the western forces during that time. Because it was also the part of the city where the weavers were concentrated, Kyoto textiles came to be called Nishijin. During the conflict, the weavers fled to Sakai, now part of Osaka Prefecture, a major trading port at that time. There they were inspired by the beautiful fabrics imported from China, Europe and the Middle East, made with techniques that were new to Japan. After they returned to Kyoto, these craftsmen laid the foundation for Nishijin Ori. This textile is made with a technique introduced from Portugal called veludo, or velvet. Because fibers stick out from the surface, it has a soft feel. It began to be produced in Japan during the Edo period from the start of the 17th century. At that time, the weavers of Nishijin used looms known as takahata, which required two people, one at the bottom weaving the weft threads, the other at the top controlling the warp threads. This style of loom was originally introduced from the Asian continent and was widely used in Nishijin. As they adopted weaving techniques from other parts of the world, the Nishijin craftsmen elevated them to new heights of sophistication. This no costume in the Karaori style is considered a masterpiece of 17th century weaving. The design features the three auspicious plants, the pine, bamboo and Japanese apricot. A traditional motif called Sho Chikubai that has been used in Japan since ancient times. The fabric is also richly decorated with gold thread. Originally from the Asian continent, the Karaori techniques were further developed in Japan and this led to the golden age of Nishijinori textiles during the Edo period. Nishijin weaving has inherited a tremendously rich cultural tradition from ancient Egypt, from India and from China. And from China it reached Japan where it achieved its pinnacle of perfection in Nishijin. During the Meiji period in the second half of the 19th century, jacquard looms were introduced from France. These looms manipulate the threads automatically based on sequences of holes made in punch cards. Jacquard looms made it possible to weave designs rapidly and with great accuracy. Weaving in Kyoto has a history stretching back around 1400 years incorporating techniques and designs from far distant countries it has developed into a cultural tradition that is uniquely Japanese 
This is a Jacquard loom like the one we saw in the video. These automated looms were invented in France and first brought into Japan in 1872. And they're operated using punch cards like these. The presence or absence of holes in the card at any given point manipulate hooks to weave the thread according to the patterns specified by the punch card. For a fairly simple design, you need about 8,000 of these. For a more complex one, up to about 20,000. It sounds fairly complex, but the technology has gone much further than this. Most of the looms operated in this workshop now are computer operated. It's always been part of the culture of Kyoto to embrace foreign influences and techniques while continuing to respect tradition. And that's true of Nishijin Ori weaving as well. And it's this adaptability that has enabled Nishijin textiles to remain among the very finest in the world. On our next video, we'll meet an artisan who's been working to restore historic textiles. In Kyoto, Nishijinori textiles are not only made into kimono and obi, they're used in other ways, such as the mountings for hanging scrolls or on folding screen. The techniques of Nishijinori are also used in restoring antique artworks, such as this painting on silk, thought to be a portrait of the historical figure Minamoto no Yoritomo. Four generations of craftsmen have worked at this textile workshop. This is one of the few workshops in Kyoto that not only produces new fabrics, but also restores antique textiles. The owner, Kenji Hirose, has restored items designated as Japanese national treasures and important cultural properties. And his skills in conservation are officially recognized by the Ministry of Culture. Hirose keeps books filled with swatches of fabrics. These samples dating from various eras in the past have been carefully preserved to serve as references to help the process of restoring antique textiles. There are five weavers working here, all of them relatives of Hirose. Most are 70 or older and possess a wealth of experience. <laughs> Hirose's son Junichi also works with him. He has only been a weaver for one year, but as the next generation of the family, he has a crucial part to play in keeping the traditional techniques alive. In recent years, Nishijin weaving has become increasingly automated, but Hirose's shop still uses hand looms. In Nishijin today, there are only a handful of shops that still weave the way we do. The others are going for mass production and trying to cut their costs. But if you are trying to recreate the textiles of the past, you can't rely on machines. To restore these valuable antiques requires enormous effort. In the case of items woven with techniques that are no longer in use, that sometimes means building replicas of the looms used during those times. If Hirose is not sure of the type of thread or weave used, he will laboriously pick apart the fabric to analyze it. After each new textile is woven, he always inspects it minutely. This is one item restored by Hirose's workshop. It's a tapestry that is designated as a national treasure. Originally made during the Heian period, around a thousand years ago, it's a bold composition depicting the Shakyamuni Buddha surrounded by a group of other figures. Hirose and his colleagues spent two years tracking down fabric samples from the era when the tapestry was made to use as references for their restoration work. The long forgotten techniques, painstakingly revived by these contemporary craftsmen, are now being passed down for posterity. I'm now in the historical archive of the Nishijin Textile Center in Kyoto, and behind me you can see a display of valuable materials that tell the history of Nishijin. This is a piece by Yasujiro Yamaguchi, who's considered a modern master. The design is of a spray of daffodils 
blooming into a pool of early spring sunlight amid melting winter snow. The snow is expressed by the fan-shaped objects in a number of different colors. The fabric was woven with the express intention of being made into a kimono, but as you can see, it's a work of art in its own right. Textiles are generally not expected to last forever, but even with the knowledge that eventually they will wear out and perish, the very finest materials, techniques and designs are used. And this is precisely why objects like kimono, folding screens and hanging scrolls, which traditionally were part of daily life in Japan, have been produced to be appreciated as art objects. On our next video, we'll take a look at a project whose aim was to elevate the artistry in Nishijinori to its ultimate level. This 900-year-old scroll, depicting scenes from the tale of Genji, is a national treasure. It's a historical artifact of great value, which gives an insight into the lifestyle of the Heian period aristocrats. When it was first painted, its colors were much more vibrant than they are today. So a plan was dreamed up to produce a version of this picture scroll woven in the Nishijin Ori style. The driving force behind the project was Itaro Yamaguchi, the head of one of Nishijin's most venerable textile workshops. Yamaguchi developed the idea of creating a Nishijin Ori version of the tale of Genji scroll more than 30 years ago, when he was 70. After seeing how the colors of the original scroll had faded over the centuries, he had an inspiration. If a textile version were created, it would be more durable and would preserve this art for future generations. Yamaguchi oversaw the entire project, creating the sketches, deciding the weaving techniques and issuing detailed instructions to the weavers. The colors selected were based on how the original picture scroll would have looked when it was painted. Once the colors of the threads were decided, a trial weaving was done. The weavers followed Yamaguchi's directions while referring to copies of the original pictures. Because the design is so intricate, every step had to be checked rigorously. Once the trial weaving was finished, Yamaguchi inspected it. Yamaguchi's aim was to create a Nishijin Ori textile that will last 1,000 years. No compromises would be accepted. In the course of producing this ambitious work, Yamaguchi pioneered a number of innovations. One of them is used in the cherry trees at the center of the first scroll. Each petal of the cherry blossom is woven with pure white thread. But when the blossom is viewed as a whole, it has a pinkish tinge. Between the individual white petals, pink threads are used, along with glinting filaments of platinum. This creates a delicate pink hue that is reflected by the platinum onto the white of the petals. To depict the texture of the kimono worn by the aristocrats on the third scroll, he came up with another innovation. It's a technique called overweaving. A thin network of extremely fine warp and weft threads is woven over the threads depicting the arm. When light strikes that area, the arm can be glimpsed through the overweaving. This contemporary work made with modern day techniques represents the culmination of centuries of tradition. Oh, 
My intention is to create the ultimate in textiles, to demonstrate just how beautiful and fascinating they can be. That is what I was thinking when I embarked on this project. So, I have imbued this tale of Genji project with all my aspirations for textiles. Yes. In 2001, the third of the four scrolls of the tale of Genji was completed. Each scroll is eight meters long. Initially, Yamaguchi hoped that the entire project could be completed within 10 years. But it took 30 years just to complete three of the four scrolls. By 2001, he was already a hundred. The colors of the original picture scroll, sadly faded by the centuries, are being brought back to vibrant life as a textile. It is hoped that this 1,000 year old epic will now survive for a further millennium in this form. In 2007, before the fourth scroll could be finished, Yamaguchi died. He was 105. But in accordance with his dying wish, his family carried on with the project. And in 2008, the fourth scroll was finally completed. All four scrolls will be preserved in the French museum, Musée Guimet, in Paris. These days in Japan, there are few opportunities for people to wear kimono, and consequently the number of artisans working in Nishiji is on the decline. 30 years ago, there were 35,000 looms operating in this district. Today, the number is down to just over 9,000. So these days, Nishijin Ori is used not just to make kimono and obi, but also for more Western-style objects. For example, fashion items like ties, accessories such as bags, and even interior furnishings like curtains. Also, the introduction of computers has helped by bringing down labor costs through automation. Even Nishijinori has had to adapt to the changing lifestyle of modern Japan. But there's every reason to hope that it will continue to survive and thrive into the future without losing its soul as a traditional handicraft. I'll see you again next time.